Good morning, Utica. Uh, this morning, we, we come to the conclusion of our little mini-series called The Jury, as we look at some of the guys who were uh, very instrumental in a negative way, obviously, in, in bringing Jesus to the cross and leading to his crucifixion. This morning, uh, we look at a, a character that most of us are probably pretty familiar with. His name is Pilate. Uh, I don't know about you, but the first time that I heard his name, I was surprised they even had airplanes back then in the biblical times. Uh, but then I learned a little bit more. And then when I heard his first name, uh, his name's Pontius Pilate. I got a little confused thinking maybe he was uh, Officer John's partner in Chips. Uh, but that's a different punch. So I thought, based on my lack of knowledge of this guy, maybe it would be a good idea for us to, to make sure we understand who it is that we're talking about today. So as we look at Pontius Pilate, just a couple of things that, that I want us to make sure we understand is he is what we would call the governor over Judea, but that's not his official title. We find that, we find that term in the New Testament. That's a fairly generic term. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't talk about a specific office, but it talks about uh, the, the responsibility he had over that area. Actually, he was appointed by Tiberius Caesar as the prefect over Judea, and he, he reigned over that area, or he ruled, uh, really he, he oversaw that area from AD 26 uh, to about 37. Some historians say 36, others say uh, 37, but uh, nonetheless, 10 or 11 years uh, looking after that region. Now, just to make sure we understand the, the relationship, last week we talked about uh, Herod Antipas, uh, not King Herod the Great that we read about in the early parts of the gospel, but Herod Antipas, one of his sons that we read about during the crucifixion narratives. And uh, we, we said that he is basically the king over, uh, over the Jews. He is the one who is ruling over the Jewish people. But the Jews weren't free at that time. They didn't, have, they didn't have freedom as a nation or as a people. They are living under the hand of the Roman government, uh, ultimately under Tiberius Caesar. But one of the things the Roman government recognized uh, throughout its years is that things tended to go a little bit better with the local people if there was a local uh, ruler over those people who was one of the people himself. So they would, they would typically allow for what we would call a vassal king, and that's basically what Herod Antipas was. He was, in fact, ruling over the people, but he answered to Pilate, and Pilate answered to Tiberius Caesar. And so we see that there is this relationship already with, with Pilate in that particular area, but it's not, it's not necessarily a good relationship. He had a very antagonistic relationship with the Jewish people for a number of reasons. Uh, we'll just mention a couple of those today, but really historians tell us uh, that, that Pilate was, was kind of a weak character. Uh, he really didn't have a lot of moral strength to him. He, he seemed to, to kind of ebb and flow with the crowd that was around him. He, he tried to make decisions a lot of times based on what he thought the people were going to like. And we're going to see uh, today that that gets him into a lot of trouble. But uh, there, there were two things in particular that happened early in his, his time as the prefect that really disturbed his relationship with the Jewish people. Uh, very soon after he became the prefect, one of the first things that he did is he, he sent Roman troops into Jerusalem, and what they did is they actually carried standards. They were, they were bearing the standards of the Roman government, which was, which was pretty typical of that day, but he added a little twist to it. Because as a part of those standards, uh, he had embalmed on the standards not just the sign of the eagle, which was the sign of the Caesar himself and, and, and the Roman government, but he actually had the image of Tiberius Caesar right there on the standard. And so you can imagine that the Jewish people, as, as they see the Roman troops coming into the city, but not only into the city, but also, as many historians tell us, into the temple courts themselves, bearing this standard, which has the image of Tiberius Caesar. You can imagine the Jews didn't like that very much because obviously that was a violation of the second commandment. The, 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 the scriptures tell the, the Lord's people they are not to bear uh, any images, not have idols, not have graven images, and, and Pilate just totally offended them very, very early. And then later in his rule, uh, he actually seized temple funds. He took funds out of the temple that was designed for the governing of the temple and the, the business of God's people, and he took those funds uh, to build an aqueduct in Jerusalem. So you can imagine uh, that didn't go over very well 
with the Jewish people. So he had done many things throughout his time to anger the people. And of course, that kind of went, went completely against the, the reason he was there in the first place. Tiberius had placed Pilate over that region because Tiberius wanted peace. Uh, we are very familiar with the term Pax Romana, the Roman peace. That's what they wanted. They didn't want a bunch of, uh, a bunch of riots. They didn't want a bunch of uproars. So Tiberius wanted, to pi- wanted Pilate uh, to have a hand on the people that there would not be this big stir. So we, we see there is a great deal of problem with that as he is dealing with the Jewish people. And of course, that is going to come to a head uh, during the crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going we're gonna to turn to Matthew chapter 27 to learn a, a lot more about Pilate and, and a lot more about how we can follow Jesus well uh, by looking at some of the things that he did, knowing that we should not do those things. Now, we're going to be in probably three different Gospels today. We're going we're gonna to take a little bit of a view at, at Luke's uh, version of this account, and we'll take a view of, of John's version of this account as well. But Matthew chapter 27 is going to be kind of our home base for the morning. So we're going to read uh, the first two verses of that chapter, and then we're going to skip down and read verses uh, 11 through 26 as well. So if you would uh, stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, you can find one uh, right in front of you in the pew rack. And uh, you can find this passage on page 24 in the New Testament if you have one of the blue Bibles or page 833 if you have one of the black Bibles in front of you. But you follow along in God's Word uh, as I read Matthew 27, verses 1 and 2, and then verses 11 through 26. It says, When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus To put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Skip down to verse 11. It says, Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. And then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, that is the feast of the Passover, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they then had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the preservation of your word. Father, I pray that as we view this account and learn more about Pilate's life, Lord, I pray that it would not just be information that we're gathering for the sake of information. Father, we pray that in the midst of this story that you would lift high your son Jesus. Father, we have sung this morning that he was wounded for our transgressions. And that like a sheep before his accusers, he stood silent. 
because He was on a mission to provide the forgiveness that we so desperately need. Uh, Father, I pray that we would learn from Jesus this morning, that we would worship Jesus and honor Jesus in our lives, and, and Lord, that you might take this episode in Pilate's life and that you might teach us on account of it. Father, we pray that you would give us ears to hear your truth and hearts to respond accordingly. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So leave your Bibles open and stay there in Matthew 27 for just a moment. Let's look again at verse 11. It says, Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Now, most of you probably know there are, there are four different gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels because most of the time uh, they give us a fairly similar perspective. And then John is kind of grouped out by himself. He's kind of singled out because he tells things from a very different perspective with a, with a different purpose in his writing. But, but with all four of those gospels, we get to glean some details about the life of Jesus, and in this particular case, about the trial of Jesus. And they all have different perspectives. They're all, they all have different purposes in their writing, and so they are reporting different details uh, about that particular night. But one of the things that all four of them record for us is this opening question that Pilate has for Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? All four gospel writers record that question. So obviously, it's an important question. It's something that we need to take note of. In fact, I would have you turn over to John chapter 18 because John gives us a lot more insight into that particular part of the conversation. Listen to what we read in John chapter 18, verse 34 and 35. When Pilate is asked this question, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you say this on your own accord or did others say it to you about me? See, one of the things that we've realized throughout this particular uh, series as we've examined uh, not just these guys that have have had a part in the crucifixion of Jesus, but as we've looked at Jesus and, and his response to the people or sometimes his lack of response to the people who were talking to him and asking him questions, one of the things that by now I hope we've realized is that Jesus isn't going to play games. Jesus isn't going to just answer questions just for the sake of answering questions. And and Jesus knows the intention of these guys' hearts. So he knows if they're they're asking a sincere question, he'll typically give them a sincere answer. But if they're just playing the game, Jesus is not interested. And so he brings that to the surface when Pilate asked this question, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, well, is this question coming from you? Because if it is, I'll answer the question, but if it's not coming from you, if you're, just, if you're just another ploy in the hands of the Jewish leaders, well, that's an entirely different story. Pilate answered, listen, listen to this, when, when Jesus is trying to draw out the reason for that question, this is Pilate's answer in verse 35. Pilate answered, am I a Jew? As if to say, Jesus, what do I care If you were the king of the Jews, I'm not a Jewish person. I'm working for the Romans. I don't care if you're the king of the Jews. So, of course, this question isn't coming from me. This is the accusation that your people have against you. Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. So what have you done? One of the things that we see from that question and from that response to the question is that Pilate demonstrated a limited view of Jesus' kingdom. Pilate demonstrated an incredibly limited view of Jesus' kingdom. Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus asked, well, tell me why you ask. And, and it's obvious in his answer that, that, that Pilate is just thinking about a small group of people. He's, just, he's probably thinking about a, a geopolitical nation that, that lives among them, and he has an entirely limited perspective of Jesus' kingdom. Listen to, how, listen to how Jesus answers that in verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. Pilate, it's not like I'm just the king over these people. It's not like I'm a political ruler. 
My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Pilate demonstrated an incredibly limited view of Jesus' kingdom. And one of the principles that we need to glean from that, because remember, we're not interested in just knowing about Pilate. We're interested in how does that affect the way we live. And so the principle that we take from that is that the lordship of Jesus is limitless. The lordship of Jesus doesn't have geopolitical boundaries. The lordship of Jesus doesn't fit into the borders of a particular nation. It's not restricted to a particular people group. And listen up, church. It's not restricted to a little box on our calendar either. The lordship of Jesus is limitless. I love the way Abraham Kuyper put it. Abraham Kuyper is a Dutch theologian from the late 1800s, early 1900s. He also served at one time as the prime minister of the Netherlands. But listen to what Abraham Kuyper said about the lordship of Jesus and his domain. Kuyper said, there is not a square inch In the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. The lordship of Jesus is limited. Now, we we may not have the same struggles that Pilate does. We're not thinking about geopolitical nations. We we know that uh, for those of us who were preparing and excited about traveling over to Israel in a few weeks, we realize that it's not just for those people in that particular land that Jesus died on the cross. and It's not just those people in that particular land and at that particular time that he ruled over. We realize that. But like I said, I think one of our dangers... It is, that, is that we can think that we can compartmentalize our life, that we can have different little sections in our life, and, and, and sometimes it says as neat and tidy as a calendar that, well, we're going to give, we're going to give the Lord Sunday and we're going to give the Lord Wednesday, but the rest of my life is, is up to me. But let's be honest, it's not usually that neat and tidy, is it? We're, we're not usually that obvious in the way that we fail to give Jesus lordship in our life. But if we're honest, all of us would have to admit there are certain areas of our life, there are certain aspects of our life that we kind of like to keep over here in our area. We don't like to give Jesus access to this area. And here's the danger. Sometimes we do that consciously, but a lot of times we don't even realize that we're doing it. A lot of times, just like Pilate, our Our understanding of Jesus' lordship, our understanding of Jesus' kingdom is so limited that we don't even understand that we are limiting his kingdom. But we think, if we're students, we think that, you know, when when I get on the bus or get in the car to go to school, that's not Jesus' territory there. I'm just a student there. Or or maybe if we we get in the car and, and head to work on a Monday morning or a Tuesday morning, A lot of times, if we're honest, we're not thinking about Jesus' lordship in that aspect of our life. Or maybe when we step onto uh, the sports field, when we start to compete in athletics or even in academics, we're we're not thinking, Jesus is Lord over this aspect of my life as well. And so we we cheat Jesus. We limit his lordship. We, We limit his kingdom in a way that that really doesn't end up cheating him, it cheats us. Because remember, Jesus said that he came to give life and to give it to the full. So any area that we are not ceding to Jesus, we are cheating ourselves. So we need to be careful that we're not doing exactly what Pilate did and having a limited view of Jesus' kingdom and not recognizing that Jesus' lordship is limitless. There is not a area of our life, not one square inch that doesn't belong to him. The way Paul put it, whether you eat or you drink, no matter matter what you're doing, even the mundane things like sharing a meal, do it all for the glory of God because it belongs to Jesus. And we can learn that from Pilate. 
But I also want us to back up a little bit. I want us to make sure we understand how it is that Jesus got to where he is and, and, and what Pilate has done about that kind of at each step of the way. Because the way the story unfolds, uh, we don't have all of Pilate's uh, interaction with Jesus kind of in one little tidy package. It kind of happens in spurts because of his reaction. So I want us to make sure we understand uh, how we got here. So still here in John chapter 18, I want you to look at, at what happens when, when the Jewish leaders bring Jesus to, to Pilate in the first place. It says they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. Verse 29 says, So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Very interesting insight right there. That, that question and answer right there tells us that the Jewish people thought it was all over already. They thought they were just bringing, to, bringing Jesus to Pilate, and he was just going to rubber stamp the death penalty, and all was going to be done. And so they're a little shocked when Pilate opens the conversation by saying, what charges do you bring? It's almost like we can hear him say, what do you mean charges? We've already convicted this guy. The trial's over. All we need is your approval because we can't kill him. So verse 30 says, they answered, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. And Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. This, this guy has nothing to do with me. Once again, that, that limited view of Jesus' kingdom, not thinking Jesus had anything to do with him. But the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. So, so the first step, the first thing that we see Pilate doing is he, he's trying to give the Jewish people the stiff arm. He's trying to give them the Heisman and say, no, no, you, this is your problem. You deal with Jesus. He, I have nothing to do with him. But they won't let him do that. They, they keep pressing in on him. You don't have to turn here, but Luke chapter 23, listen to a, a, a detail that we looked at a little bit last week just to refresh our memories. Luke chapter 23, verse 7, it says, When Pilate learned that Jesus belonged to Herod's jurisdiction... He sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. So what is, what is his second attempt? Well, I can't, I can't just pawn him off on the Jewish people. They won't take him. Ah, he's from Galilee. And Herod is, that's Herod's jurisdiction. And Herod happens to be in town. I'll just, I'll pawn him off on Herod. That's the story we looked at last week. We know that he sent him over and Jesus had not one word for Herod. Because Herod just wanted to see the magic show. He just wanted to see Jesus do a bunch of cool tricks. He had, he had no interest in who Jesus really was. So he tries to pawn him off on Herod, and that didn't work. So now heading back to Matthew 27, going back to this particular portion of the story that we're looking at this morning. Pick, pick it back up in Matthew 27 in verse 12. So when Jesus was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. And then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But Jesus gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. We can almost hear, he, he's, he knows he's in trouble. He's trying to get Jesus to incriminate himself. He's trying to get Jesus to give him something that he can act on, but Jesus is not speaking to anything. And he's amazed. Verse 15, now, step three, attempt number three. Now, at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Now, we don't know a lot about Barabbas from the New Testament, but uh, other sources seem to indicate that Barabbas was, was a zealot. He was probably trying to overthrow the Roman government himself. He was guilty of murder. And so here he is in prison in the hand of the Romans. And Pilate says, ah, I, can, I can offer them a choice between Barabbas in Jesus. So in verse 17, so when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who was called Christ? So step one didn't work. His first attempt to pawn off Jesus didn't work. 
to the Jewish people. His, his second attempt to pawn off Jesus didn't work. Herod, Herod couldn't make any progress with him. So he comes back to, to Pilate. And so option number three is, well, I'll put it in the hands of the crowd. And then we have some insight as to why he did that. Look at verse 18. For, that's a very important word there, don't skip over little words. Uh, we're, we, we work on reading a bunch at home, and I've, I've noticed that, that Stephen sometimes skips over the little words, because I, I think he's just, he's so interested in getting to the bigger part of the story that well, those little words don't matter. But let me tell you, in, in, in Bible reading, little words matter a lot, especially little words that come at the beginning of a sentence, because they tell us how that sentence is connected to the previous sentence. And this previous sentence had just told us that Pilate had offered the crowd the choice. I'm going to leave it up to you. You get to decide whether you're going to pick Jesus or Barabbas. And that word for tells us why he did that. Here's his strategy. For he knew that it was out of envy that they, that they would be the Jewish leaders. He knew that it was out of envy that the Jewish leaders had delivered him up to Pilate in the first place. What does that mean? That means that Pilate is analyzing the situation, and he's not buying any of this from the Jewish leaders. He realizes that the charges they have against Jesus are all trumped up. They are, they're all bogus. There's nothing legitimate about them. He knew that the real reason that Jesus was standing before him was not because he had done anything that was really offensive to the Jewish people, but because they envied him. They knew that he was gaining popularity with the crowds. We've seen that in some of our previous episodes. And so he's thinking, ah, if they are envious of this guy, that means that the crowds must like this guy. And so if I give the crowds a choice between this murderer named Barabbas and this guy that obviously they must like a lot, they're going to release Jesus and I'm going to be in the clear. And so he has this strategy. And then we actually get one more little nugget of information as to why he was doing that. Look at verse 19. Besides, some, some, some versions say and, some surgeons say but. It's just a small word in the Greek there. It's kind of hard to understand the, the, the true meaning there. But besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat his wife sent word to him. Now, you can imagine already, before you even finish, something important's going on. Because he is, he's on a capital murder trial, and his wife sends him a note. Now, Andrea knows she always has an open line of communication. Uh, hopefully, I've demonstrated that to you. I, I've probably had many conversations with many of you visits. If Andrea calls, if I see Andrea Goodrow or home on my phone, I'm answering. But in the times where it's really important... In the times that I, I've got something really crucial going on, I'll, I'll give them a heads up ahead of time and say, listen, I, I, I've got this meeting going on. I'm counseling with the situation. So if there's any way you can wait in the midst of this, just, just wait. But still, if that phone rings and it says, Andrea, I'm answering. So you know this is important because I'm sure Pilate's wife understood the same thing. And while he is on the judgment seat, she sent word to him, and listen to what she says. Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Boy, I wish we had more about that. Man, I wish we had some more insight about what that really meant, but we don't. And we don't, we don't need to speculate. But here's what we know. His wife had some reason. She had a dream of some sort. We don't know if it's from God. Matthew doesn't tell us that. Now, Matthew is the guy who told us back in chapters 1 and 2 that, that dreams had come from God for both Joseph and for the wise men. So we know God communicates in dreams, but Matthew doesn't, he didn't clarify that for us. We don't know if that's a dream from God or if her conscience is bothering her. What's interesting, this is a different sermon, but what's interesting is her language is actually very similar to what the demons would say to Jesus when they encountered Jesus. That phrase where she says, have nothing to do with this man, there's a phrase that the demons often use, which literally translated, nothing between me and you. Which means the demons would recognize, listen, we have nothing in common. 
So what are you doing here? But whatever it is, whatever her intentions are, she sends word to Pilate, hey, you need to have nothing to do with this guy. Notice that she doesn't say, you need to set him free. We don't know if that's what she means. But she just says, listen, make sure that you're not responsible for this one. Because I just had a dream today, and we are going to suffer greatly. So knowing that the, that the crowd loves Jesus, or at least so Pilate thought, and having received this message from his wife that he needs to have nothing to do with him, then he, he pursues option number three. I'm going to give the choice to the crowds. So what we see in this is that Pilate, over and over again, pursued passivity in an effort to avoid responsibility. I I hope that you saw that all throughout the story. I'm going to try to pawn him off on the Jewish people. Nope, they won't take him. I'm going to try to pawn him off on Herod. Nope, Jesus won't talk to Herod. I'm going to try to pawn him off on the crowd. Maybe the crowd will do my job for me. Do you notice that in, in every aspect of the story, at every step, Pilate is trying to stay as far away as he can as possible from actually bearing any responsibility for this. Pilate pursued passivity in an effort to avoid responsibility. But listen to verse 20. This is what he failed to take into account. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to destroy Jesus. So here's a little biblical myth for you. And I've confessed before that I've perpetuated this myth in the past. But I think I've come clean on that. But here's this little myth. The myth is that the same crowd that on Palm Sunday was, was crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, that just a few days later on this early Friday morning, that same crowd that was crying out, Hosanna, is now saying, crucify him, crucify him. But the Bible doesn't tell us that's the same crowd. In fact, the gospel writers give us very good reason to believe it's not the same crowd. Here's one of the hardest moments I had in studying this text, church. Where are the followers of Jesus? Where are his disciples? Where are the people that will speak up for Jesus? When Pilate offers the option to the crowd. He, has, he, is, he is being completely passive, trying to avoid all responsibility. But can you imagine how it might have been different if some of his followers had been there to stand up for Jesus? Let me ask you a harder question. Where are his followers on the school campus? Where are his followers in the office? Where are his followers on the basketball court? Where are his followers on date night? Where are his followers when the name of Jesus gets dragged through the mud? Are we being just like Pilate, completely passive, hoping that somebody else will do what we know needs to be done? But notice notice verse 20. The elders and the chief priests, they're working the crowds. Church, you better hear this loud and clear. We might be passive. Our enemy is not passive. If we're going to delegate the responsibility over to somebody else, our enemy says, yep, I'll take it. I'll run with it. That's exactly what we read in 1 Peter 5, 8. Peter tells us your adversary prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. We may be passive, but he is not. The church who believes in the truth of God's word may be passive, but the world who wants to reject it is not passive. We can't just leave it in the hands of others. Are we going to let Satan destroy our families? Are we going to let Satan destroy our marriages? Are we going to let Satan destroy our witness? Are we going to let Satan take our schools from us? Are we going to let Satan have have reign over the athletic fields? Are we going to let Satan be the CEO over our business? we got to stop being so passive. Pilate pursued passivity 
because he wanted to avoid responsibility. But that's not how it works in the kingdom of God. Well, let me, let me share with you a principle that I'm, that I'm borrowing from Robert Lewis. Uh, many men in our church, about 40 men are gathering on, on Thursday mornings, way too early in the morning, to learn about how to be real men of God. And we're not there yet to this portion of the study, but Robert Lewis gives us a biblical definition of manhood. And it goes something like this. Real men reject passivity, just the opposite of what Pilate's doing. Real men reject passivity, accept responsibility, lead courageously, and expect God's rewards. I agree with Robert Lewis, but I'll take it one step further. I don't think you have to just talk about men in that particular scenario. Notice that I changed one of the words there. Not just real men reject passivity. Real leaders reject passivity and accept responsibility. And this is the portion where where many of us are thinking, I'm glad he's not talking about me. I'm not a leader. I'm just an average dude. I'm just a follower. I'm just a church member. But remember, if you are a follower of Jesus, you are also to be a disciple maker. And you cannot disciple, you cannot make disciples without leading people. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I acknowledge leaders must first be led, feeders must first be fed, but every single one of us who has a relationship with Jesus is called to be a leader. And if we're going to be real leaders, we have to reject passivity. We have to own up to the kind of responsibility that God has placed upon us, and we need to be able to stand firm for Jesus. And we need to be able to defend our families. And we need to be able uh, to, to be very firm in, in many different areas of our life because if we're not active, our enemy's going to be active in our marriages, in our discipleship efforts. I read a quote one day that said, you don't want to disciple your children? The world will be happy to disciple your children. You can be, you can be passive all you want to. We all got to be careful about that. As we grow older in years, and believe me, every year I get older, I feel like I'm growing older in years. I feel like I'm getting closer and closer and closer. And if we we are not careful, we fall into the mentality that when I reach a certain age, I can just relax. I can say, I've done all that stuff. I've served my time. It's time for me to be fed. It's time for me to get something for myself. There is not one shred of of biblical truth in that mindset. We have to reject passivity. One of the ways that we say it around here is that we soak it up and we serve it out. If we have a whole life worth of nothing but soaking it up, we're being too passive. We cannot hand that over, even in the area of evangelism. Listen, if we have this mindset, I I heard heard a, a church pastor say this one time that, well, you know, God will bring the people to our church that he wants at our church. Just let God do the work there. No, God has told us to do the work of an evangelist. And believe me, church, if we're not doing the work, if we want to be passive in the area of evangelism, believe me, the Muslims say, okay, we'll we'll take it up from there. We'll continue to be one of the fastest growing religions in the entire world. You don't want to share the good news of Jesus Christ. We'll share what we have to offer. Church, we cannot continue to be so passive. Real leaders reject passivity, accept responsibility, lead courageously, and expect God's rewards. Go back to Matthew 27 as we finish up the story. The governor said to them again, he said to the crowds again, which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? And they all said to him, let him be crucified. Pilate said, why? What evil has he done? That that should be enough to tell us. Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent. Why is he giving the crowds the ability to either kill Jesus or release Jesus. Jesus hadn't done anything worthy of being locked up in the first place. But he's still leaving it in the hands of the people. Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let 
him be crucified. Go back to John one more time. Look at John chapter 18, verse 37. Incredible insight that John offers to us. I think it shows us a lot about his mindset here. Jesus said to Pilate, You say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? I love the way that John Bloom has, has captured the essence of that question. John Bloom is a, is, a, is a writer for the Desiring God website. That's the ministry of John Piper. He's writing about this particular episode. This is an excerpt from an article he wrote called Pilate, Powerful, Pragmatic Pawn of Providence. And it's this conversation that Pilate's wife and Pilate had after the fact. Listen to how the conversation goes. Procula says, that's his wife, as far as we know, Claudia Procula says, aren't you supposed to administer justice from Rome's tribunal? Pilate said, no, I'm supposed to make sure that Judea poses no problems for Tiberius. And his wife says, even if that means ignoring the truth? Notice what Pilate says. Truth? Whose truth? The Sanhedrin's truth? Tiberius' truth? Your dream's truth? Jesus' truth? No, it's truth that got the Galilean killed. I love that insight. So when Jesus says, I'm here to bear witness to the truth, and Pilate says, what is truth? It's almost like he's saying, listen, Jesus, everybody has their own version of this. Who am I supposed to listen to? There, there's no truth in all of this. Church, does that sound familiar? There's no truth that we can count on. What may be true is not what may be true for you doesn't have to be true for me. Church, that's not how it works. Truth is truth. But what we see here is that Pilate exchanged the truth of Jesus for a lie. Pilate exchanged the truth for a lie. Now notice again this contrast. Jesus said, everyone who listens to the truth listens to my voice. But notice the detail that we get in, in Luke 23. Luke 23, 23 says, but they, that is the crowd... They were urgent, demanding with loud cries that Jesus should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. Jesus said, if you listen to the truth, you're going to listen to my voice. But in this particular instant, the voice of the crowd prevailed. Church, who are we listening to? Whose voice is going to prevail in our life? Now look how the, the end of the story unfolds. Verse 24 of Matthew 27. When Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, all of his options, all of his attempts at shirking responsibility, they had all failed. When Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and he washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Pilate thought that he could just leave it in somebody else's hands. But church, here's the principle for us. We cannot abandon the truth and avoid the consequences. We cannot abandon the truth and avoid the consequences. Not even Matthew will let us think that Pilate could avoid the consequences. Pilate said, not on my hands. I've washed my hands of this I am not guilty of the blood of Jesus, but notice the last verse of that passage. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. That's Matthew's way of saying it is on his hands. He is responsible because, church, we cannot 
abandon the truth and avoid the consequences. So what is the truth? Really, it's not what is the truth. It's who is the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth and the life and the way. No one comes to the Father except by me. That's the truth. The truth is every one of us stands guilty before a holy God. And there's not a single thing that we can do to work our way out of that. We owe a debt to God that we cannot pay ourselves, but Jesus Christ, our Savior, died our death, as we sang just a few moments ago, that we might be raised to life by trusting in Him. Church, what are we doing with the truth? Are we responding appropriately to the truth? Maybe you're, maybe you're here this morning and, and you have been confronted yet again with the truth of the gospel that reminds you that you are a sinner who needs a Savior. But all these things that happened in history aren't going to do you a bit of good unless you trust Jesus, unless you surrender your life to Jesus. So will you respond to the truth? Or will you turn your back on the truth? And when the way of Jesus gets hard in our life, will we turn our back on the truth? Or will we stand for the truth? The choice is up to us. Let's pray together.